So good evening, everyone. Uh, as Amanda said, I'm Rob Woolsey, and I'm a Battlefield Tour Guide, and we're going to be talking about Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily. What most people don't know, this was really the first offensive action by the Canadians in the Second World War. So uh, there's some really interesting things about going to Sicily. Uh, it's an amazing and beautiful place. Uh, it's got great food, great beaches, great wine. Uh, it's just an amazing place. And so this is one of the most interesting battles because it's got a really neat story. Even though we were fighting in some of the backwater locations in the island, there are some very significant things that happened. And some of the people that were involved are fairly famous Canadians. So I just would like you to know that MFS Europe is not affiliated with me in any direct way or anything that I do. They've asked me to do this as because I'm a battlefield tour guide. And they're, they, of course, they don't sponsor or endorse anything. Just to let you guys know. So we're talking about the island of Sicily. It is just off of Italy, separated by the Straits of Messina, which is also the name of one of the towns, uh, larger cities. Um, and we're going to talk about an overview of, of the place. We're going to talk about some recommended preparations. Really important when you do battlefield tours, travel advisories, a few helpful hints about, hints about the island, uh, the must-try uh, food. Oh, my goodness, it was lovely to eat there. Um, the best places to stay, this is a bit of a challenge because it's a fairly large area we're talking about, even though it's a fairly small place, it is kind of large, um, and transportation challenges. And then we're going to talk about uh, the first part of the battle, southeastern Sicily, from the 10th to the 12th of July, so the very beginning of the invasion and the landing beaches. Then we're going to talk about the second phase for the Canadians, which is Gurianta to Valgunera. Um, again, it's not a huge chunk of the battle, but it was another big burst that the Canadians did. And then um, one of the worst parts of the fighting, which is in and around the uh, village of Agira, and some of the actions around there was a four-day really brutal battle, um, cost a large number of Canadian lives. And then we're going to talk about the very final phase, which is the Valganera to Cemento, which is basically takes place kind of at the same time. It starts about the same time as the fighting for uh, Agira, and then it carries on till almost the middle of August when the Canadians were pulled out of the line. So we're talking about Italy. And not only we're we talking about Italy, but we're talking about Sicily. And most Sicilians will tell you they're not Italian, they're Sicilian. Um, so uh, the island of Sicily has a population of 4.9 million people, and they're lovely, wonderful. But they do speak two languages. They do speak Italian. But they also, a majority of them will also speak Sicilian, which is a different language completely. They are a, a late joiner to the Italian Confederation. So there are two major international airports on the island. There's a few others. We're actually going to talk about one that no longer exists. Uh, so there's Catania uh, Airport or Catania, I can't even pronounce this, Fontan, Fan, Fontan Arosa Airport, which is uh, on the eastern end of the island. And then there's Palermo Airport. Those are the two really big ones. For, for you guys, if you want to see the Canadian stuff, Catania is the closest international airport. So Sicily was technically an independent country um, up until 1860 when it was unified with Italy. And in 1946, it became an autonomous region again, right, post-war. Uh, it was very much, there's some interesting stories. The, the Sicilian campaign is one that uh, my mentor as a guy has told me, if somebody doesn't know what they want to see, take them to, to Sicily, because it's got everything from paratroopers, commandos, tanks, air battles, naval battles, infantry, near run things, disasters, heroic things. It's it's pretty spectacular. And it's sunny and warm, he said. So on average, it costs a little bit less than mainland Italy, but Italy is the 27th most expensive country in the world to live in. So that should give you kind of a rough what the costs are like. Uh, so Sicily, of course, is a rich and unique culture and area. There is ruins from all sorts of things there. There's uh, an active volcano there, Mount Etna, which is just absolutely spectacular. There's lots of stuff when it comes to arts and music, literature, cuisine, everything. It, but, uh, and this is an interesting fact, the 1930 um, Baydacre Guide to Southern Italy specifically says don't visit Jul in July or August because it's too hot. The invasion of Sicily happened the 9th, 10th of July, 1943, and ended the middle of August, 1943. So they didn't read the guide when not to visit there. So summer, it's hot and dry. It is, uh, in fact, even into late September when I was uh, I, I was there in, at one point in September for one visit, and it was, um, I think it was 36 degrees on the waterfront. So it was gorgeous, but it's got wet and mild winters. 
Uh, you can travel there year round, but the high season, of course, obviously is the summer. In the summer, dress for heat, hats included, but in the winter time or, or the wetter seasons, bring a raincoat. It's it's like most of Europe, you're you're going to get wet. Always travel with travel insurance. Um, you never know what's going to go wrong. I always do. It's not worth it. So the the country is family friendly. The island is family friendly. I have not found a single thing that is not family friendly. Uh, even the wine tour, uh, we did a wine tour and they had stuff for the kids as well. So uh, yes, mine are teenagers, but I mean, that kind of helps. But there are no city passes for Sicily. It's not that type of, uh, of region. So check your country requirements before you travel, of course, for COVID in this day and age. There is no requirement for a visa if you're entering the, from the EU, which is super convenient. So crime exists, both petty and organized crime. And so that's something to be very aware of, that organized crime is a thing in Italy, um, especially in Sicily. Urban centers all have hospitals and clinics. I did a quick search myself um, because we didn't know where any of them were, in fact. And, there, and most of the urban centers will have one uh, or a clinic of some type or a, a major hospital. Uh, 112 is the emergency number, just like everywhere else in Europe. Uh, and the only embassy consulate in Italy is actually in Rome. So if something goes wrong, you have to actually contact Rome. And it is in the same time zone, which is convenient. So some helpful tips. Highways. Not all of them, but some of them have tolls and not everyone has service. So you need your services like fuel and food and things like that. So you need to really check before you start heading off because that's one thing you need to be aware of. Uh, the battlefields have all been cleared. And in this case, there is a threat of war remains, but it is fairly low. It, Italy was the Sicilian campaign was a fairly short one and, and not um, known for its epic bombardments or epic um, um massive battles so while there could be war remains it's really really low it's not like visiting parts of france or germany or places like that belgium uh be aware that of course crime is an issue in sicily and it's something when i was doing the website that they need you to be aware of and they need you to secure your vehicle don't leave valuables in your car it is a common problem there and it's actually in fact been on the increase as of late so sicily food oh yes these things are spectacular. Well, there's cannoli. You can't go wrong with cannolis. I'm sorry. They're just spectacular. Uh, they're actually, that's kind of like a, a rice type ball, as I recall. Um, I didn't have it, unfortunately, but um, it looked so yummy. It looked really good. But the cannoli we had there was just absolutely amazing. It was to die for. Um, they have this uh, farsu margu, which is kind of like a, um, a, a pork wrapped and stuffed with spinach. And there's, of course, there's lemon in it. It's just again, to die for. A lot of their food is based on seafood and vegetables. Uh, this is one of the few, uh, the one on the left is one of the few with meat. Uh, and they have uh, famous seafood pasta, lots of codfish, lots of, of um, I wish I could remember the other fish off the top of my head. I can't, but it was really quite good. They also have a big wine industry. Mount Etna is known for its wine. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, I, I, I ate very well in Sicily. So if you if you don't eat well in Sicily, you've probably done something wrong. So this is the challenge about wearing to stay. So there's two ways to view the battlefields. You have a base location and you drive to your town sites or you have you drive the route and you stay as you go. If you're doing the base station style, Catania is the best city to stay at. It offers the most amenities. It's only about an hour from all the Canadian battlefields, uh, hour, hour and a quarter. And it, it's kind of got everything you could possibly want, including the airport. If you stay as you go, I always say start a Paggio, Pan, Pacino, Pacino, work your way up to Aguirre and then Valuguera are like, you just kind of follow the route of the battle. And that's a good way to do it in chunks because you can actually kind of get out and walk a little bit more. Um, there's not a ton of memorials, but you can actually see the battlefield and there's actually a lot of damage you can still see in the area. The ride services, ride services exist in Sicily, but be wary because taxis and ride shares are kind of known to scam customers there. So you kind of want to get your price in advance and, and, and things like that. Uh, it, it was one of the big highlights that I noticed. Um, we didn't use the ride share service because of some of the problems. We actually hired a, uh, hired a driver. Um, and the tour guides do exist, but research. Not every guide is going to give you what you want. Um, two great sources. Uh, of course, I, through Wilsey's Warwalk, and uh, one good resource. But if you want something else, the Guild of Battlefield Guides website, you can actually ask for a guide to say, this is what I'm looking for. And they provide excellent services. Uh, that's how I get some of my clients. But it's also how most of the, my peer guides and the master guides get theirs. And it's through the guide and they're really good. 
code of conduct rules. Um, we do training all the time. So they're a really good resource for guides. And, and some of them are really specialized in certain areas. Uh, so one of my mentor guys, John Contrell, is a loves Sicily and goes there all the time. So international driver's license, really important when you're renting a car. Uh, Italy, I believe, is one of those big ones. Just it's a good thing to have. So on to the real stuff. So in the spring of 1943, the Allies had just won their victory in North Africa. And they had this massive, well-equipped force, and they needed to make another move with it. Because once you're in the Mediterranean, it's kind of hard to move it anywhere else. So right now, in the planning phase, they had the British Eighth Army under Bernard Law Montgomery, General Montgomery. And it was really a Commonwealth force. So it had India, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, and the Australian units were leaving at that point. Um, and eventually Canadian, but not in, in early 1943. And then there's the American um, Seventh Army was formed, uh, commanded by Lieutenant General uh, George S. Patton, the one of the movie fame. Um, and if you've seen the movie Patton and you see the thing on the Sicilian campaign in that movie, it, most of it's lie. So together they formed what's called the 15th Army Group. And they came under the man, a, a commander named General Harold Alexander, who later post-war became the Governor General of Canada, in fact. Um, and he was much loved by Canadians. The Canadian Army was still in the United Kingdom at this point and had seen no real action. The only two things they'd done was the 1942 Dieppe raid, which was, um, I don't like the word fiasco. It went badly and there were some challenges and, and it was a tough fight. Um, and then the only other option that they'd done was the 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade had landed in France. Most people don't realize this. In 1940, May of 1940, to help reestablish the 2nd British Expeditionary Force to fight the Germans. Uh, and then they were quickly realized that that was not going to go well, and we were in, nobody was in any position to reestablish a line. And so they evacuated, and the Canadian Brigade actually pulled off with all of its equipment, which was they were ordered to abandon it, and they didn't. And uh, some of the commanders that are in this battle were junior officers in 1940 and took part in that campaign. So the problem is, is that Canada's army had been in England since 1939, and it's now 1943. And now they've got discipline problems because we've got all this Canadian troops, at this point, four divisions building up and the fifth on the way. And we weren't getting into action. We were the only partner that wasn't in the fight. Everybody else was in combat somewhere in the world. So the Canadian um, government and a couple of the junior commanders pressured uh, the government uh, and the chief of staff at the time, who later became the commander of the 1st Canadian Army, the chief of staff was a man named uh, Harry Criar, a First World War veteran. Uh, and he really wanted them to get into the fight. So, unfortunately, General McNaughton, who was the commander of the Canadian Army, 1st Canadian Army at the time in England, didn't want to break up the Canadian Army, the two corps we had, because he wanted them to fight together, didn't want them to be broken up. It's very World, World War I kind of things. And McNaughton is a very controversial man in Canadian military circles, uh, and so is Harry Criar and their relationship. But the government was asked, the government asked for it, the British agreed to it. They swapped out a British 3rd Infantry Division who landed on June on Sword Beach beside the Canadians in 1944 for the 1st Canadian Division. And it was under the command of a man named Major General Salmon, who was Canada's premier commander at the time. He was the rock star. The Brits liked him. He was capable, competent. He was awesome. And they attached to that division, the 1st Canadian Division, the 1st Canadian Army Tank Brigade, later First Armored Brigade, under Brigadier Wyman, who was Canada's premier, other than General Worthington, he was the best armored commander the Canadians had. And they're the two most senior Canadian units. They're the ones that ended up in England first, so they got first into action, essentially. But tragedy struck before things even got started, because General Solomon was on his way to North Africa to start planning the invasion with the 8th Army. Uh, he and his senior staff were getting onto two different airplanes, and his airplane took off, and crashed and all his half his major staff were killed and we're talking his chief of staff uh, his major logistics planner as a a, a a assistant adjutant general and quartermaster right it's an acronym that's impossible that's why they changed it um so of course now he had to be replaced so they quickly grabbed a guy named major general guy simons who is uh, an interesting character in uh, canadian military circles he had never commanded anything in action he started the war as a major. He was a member of the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. We will not hold that against him. And, and he is, uh, had been in the job as the new 2nd Division commander uh, only a few days before all of a sudden he was being parachuted into the 1st Canadian Division and flown to North Africa to start planning 
a major amphibious assault. So the problem was the insertion of the Canadian Infantry Division and Armored Brigade caused a little bit of chaos for the Canadians because Canada had just introduced the Sten gun to its troops, to the infantry. So they just finished drawing them, had turned in all their Thompson submachine guns, and then they had to redraw their Thompson submachine guns and turn back in their Stens, caused some problems. They had to draw the new fancy anti-tank weapon called the Piat, a projector infantry anti-tank, basically take a giant spring that launches a, a, a heat, a high explosive anti-tank warhead, an awful beast of a thing, um, but very effective. Um, but they had to get issued and trained up that. It was brand new in 1943, so it was like top secret, caused some problems. And they had to change tanks because Canada was using the Ram tanks, um, which was a hybrid between an American, two different American tanks. It was a generation between them. And they had to replace them with Sherman tanks. So very similar tank, same engine, in fact, to some of the versions, but not the ones that we were drawing, of course, but and a different gun. So 1st Canadian Infantry Division, of course, now is trying to get all this done and nobody knows where they're going in the division other than the senior officers. But the division is made up of three infantry brigades, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade, each with three infantry battalions, so one less battalion than the First World War. And what's interesting is this division has all three regular force infantry battalions in it. The Royal Canadian Regiment are in 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade, the PPCLI are in the 2nd Brigade, and the Vandus are in the 3rd. But the most interesting thing about this is that there's only one battalion of infantry served in the 1st Canadian Division in both World Wars, and that was the 48th Highlanders out of Toronto, a reserve unit. They're the only one that served in both. Uh, it served in the 1st Brigade in the Second World War and in the 3rd Brigade in the First World War. So it's, it's a pretty unique honor for them. So the landings in southeastern Sicily. Sicily. When they were sailing to Sicily, uh, they actually lost three warships of Canadians' um, uh, equipment and some Canadian soldiers as well, which caused some chaos a little bit later on in the in the campaign. And we're going to, well, I'll mention that in more detail what it affected. So they sailed from England through the Mediterranean into Sicily. And the Canadians were landing on the southeast corner of Sicily. Um, the, the map you can see kind of where the landing areas are. It's, it's beautiful beaches, by the way. Uh, this is the landing beach behind me uh, two days after the landing. Um, I think that's Sugar Beach. So the invasion, as I said, for the Canadians began at the 10th of July with us landing on the southeastern corner. Uh, there was a British division immediately to the north of us, which is the 51st, uh, um, or 50th and 51st divisions. And then the Americans were landing further west of us. So with the 1st Canadian Brigade under a man named Brigadier General Graham, the Royal Canadian Regiment under a man named Lieutenant Colonel Crow and the Hastings and Prince Edward Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Sutcliffe, who were both later killed in action on this campaign, uh, landed on the right-hand side of a Roger Beach using an amphibious truck called a Duck, D-U-K-W. Basically take a two and a half ton cargo truck and put all these flotation things on it and propellers. They're really neat to see. Um, and when you see them in action, they can drive right into the water like a car, and then they start to float. Uh, and that's how the troops want to cross to land because there's some sandbars. Um, they called it an artificial beach in the official history. And they also used the regular landing craft as well, landing craft assaults. So they actually launched from their warship, their transports at 4 a.m. on the on the 10th of July. And for them, the Hasty P landed about 45 minutes later. Um, Farley Mowat, the author, actually was in the first wave. Uh, he was a platoon commander in the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment. He had a very interesting career with them. Um, one of the first casualties of the Canadians was actually out of his platoon as he hit the beach. Uh, a man walked off and was utterly, was one of his bravest soldiers, supposedly froze up with fear and then got struck by a bullet and, and died. Um, and then there was the Royal Canadian Regiment landed about 90 minutes after, so an hour and a half after leaving their transport, they got a little bit lost on the run in. There are some challenges trying to get ashore and formed up. But luckily, the, these two battalions faced almost no opposition in the landing. Um, they moved quickly off and took the town of uh, Manchuni, and then they moved up north and captured the airfield at Pacino by 9 a.m., clearing the town and holding their assigned objectives north and west of the town and protecting the airfield. This airfield no longer exists today. Um, it's gone completely. It's now an industrial area. Not really a surprise. It was a military airfield. The other brigade that landed was the 2nd Canadian Brigade under Brigadier Chris Vokes. So he's a PPC. He had the PPC alive with him under Lieutenant Colonel Ware and the Sea Force under a man named Lieutenant Colonel Bert Hoffmeister. 
Uh, Bert Hoffmeister later went on to command 5th Canadian Armour Division and had a very successful war. They landed on the left on a place called Sugar Beach, but they had some really bad navigational challenges, and the sea force ended up landing on the wrong side of the beach. Like, they were supposed to land on the other complete side of the PPCLI, and they ended up completely in the wrong spot. But they quickly, um, thanks to no, almost no resistance yet again, these are Italian coastal troops that they're defending, are defending this, and they just, they weren't there, they just didn't didn't show up to, to the fight. Um, and they broke through their beaches quickly, and they moved inland and captured all of them, moving north and west of a place called Panto Lagarini. Uh, and their next move, of course, uh, started that same night and actually moved, started moving northwestwards to the town of Ispica, which you can see kind of in the map. Now, the 3rd Canadian Brigade, which is uh, landed about midday, along with the tanks of the Three Rivers Regiment. The only armored regiment that actually landed and fought in Sicily was the Three Rivers Regiment. Um, and, and they actually moved, uh, they came inland and they moved to a place called Bugino, about three miles west of Pacci, Pacino. Um, so the 10th of July, we lost 10 soldiers killed in action and 22 wounded, but they captured 650 mostly Italian prisoners of war and about uh, killed about 100 of them. A huge success for the Canadians, huge success. The And again, this is first naval landing by the Canadians ever. So this is a big deal for them. Uh, the 11th of July brought the 2nd Brigade's Loyal Edmonton Regiment under a man named uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jefferson. There's an armory named after him in uh, in Edmonton now. Uh, they brought them into action and they continued the advance to Ispica and captured that town by about midday. Uh, and then the PPCLI leapfrogged through them moving on towards uh, Modica with the seaports in support. A very, very planned, very deliberate set of operations. Simon's planned this one very quite well. The 1st Canadian Brigade uh, left the town of uh, Bergio that afternoon and moved towards the town of Ragusa with the RCR in the lead at this point. The 12th had the, the Royal Canadian Regiment actually just a little bit east of Ragusa and then only to discover that they stumbled into patrols of the American 45th Infantry Division who had taken the town the night before. So this was the uh, the official link up of the British 8th Army and the American 7th Army. Uh, little point of note, the Americans had a really rough time on the 11th. Uh, the Canadians faced the same unit later on. The Hermann Goering Panzer Division, with some Tiger tanks and a whole bunch of things, did a mass armored rush down to the beach. And they actually got within a thousand yards of the American beach, um, which caused a whole lot of problems. Uh, there was not very much air cover in that sector. They were having a hard time with getting airplanes. It was a really rough time. And it took naval gunfire to basically blast. It's called the death ride of Italian armor because the Italians and the Germans went crashing down and the Italians just got humbled. But so did the Germans. And they beat it off. The PPCLI, at the same time as the uh, link-up was happening, ordered the bombardment of the town of Madaka as a warning, which actually worked because they basically ordered a bombardment. They shot shots and rounds, and they captured the town without any problems at all, any resistance at all. They just walked in. So uh, the divisional commander, Guy Simons, of course, in this town, there was an Italian general named Achille de Havet, who had actually won the Military Cross, which is a British-Canadian award at this time, uh, in the First World War, when he was fighting with us as an ally in the Italian front, and uh, he surrendered to General Simons. It caused a bit of a, a challenge, uh, because originally the man who caught him was a young officer, and he would not surrender to said young officer. He wanted to surrender to somebody of his rank. So they had to dig up Simons from the beach in his divisional command post to get this guy to surrender. A surrender. Uh, but it's also, he's the first general from the Axis side to surrender to a Canadian. So big feather in the cap. The last real move this on this phase of it was when the Hastings Prince Edward and 48, the 1st Brigade, captured the town of Garanta uh, late on the 12th after a really hot, dusty advance. Uh, remember how I said that the the Baedeker guide said, don't visit Sicily in July and August, it's too hot. Yeah, so it was hot. So this is uh, Roger Beach today is on the right-hand corner. It's beautiful, uh, lots of stuff there to see. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, just at Pascio itself, there's this Canadian monument to Operation Husky. It's really quite easy to get to. It's, there's a few Canadian monuments. Um, if it looks a little dusty and dirty, well, it's Sicily. It's really lots of volcano activity and dusty and dirty. Uh, the bottom photo is the LERs, Loyal Edmonton Regiment, uh, moving in on the 12th. Um, as you can see, some of them are wearing pants and some of them are wearing shorts. Uh, so this was a challenge. Malaria was a big problem. Um, malaria medication was not consistently taken. There was not a lot of understanding of it. Um, 
it was hot during the day. There wasn't any in our mosquitoes, but then at night it would cool off and there'd be lots of mosquitoes. So you'd wear shorts and some guys would go shirtless or open top. Huge problem for the Allied forces. But you can see they're kind of mixed dress kind of uh, outfits. So Garanta de Valgonera, this is a really tough advance. So if you look at the corner map, you'll see some arrows going up and then they're coming back down. Those are attacks that went forward and then got pushed down because that's actually going up quite a steep ravine. Army. So the next phase of the Canadians' battles, uh, there's a one-day pause. And then um, it really began for the Canadians on the 15th. Uh, it was a series of moves began with the Royal Canadian Regiment moving north from Garanta down a whole slew of secondary roads, which are the ones you would drive down to see these places, taking the town of Vizzini, and then with the Hastings Prince Edward, then taking over the lead down Highway 24. And if you Google map it, that's now SS-124 on the maps. Uh, and they had uh, the support of the Three Rivers Regiment, and they were moving up to the town um, of Garamachal, and this is where they got Amish. This is the first time the Canadians bumped into the Hermann German Panzer Division. They were moving into this town. It was tight. It was small. It, the Hermann German Division opened fire on them. It was um, it was an ugly fight. The Canadians took the town. They lost a number of vehicles, including uh, three Bren carriers and a Sherman, uh, and 25 casualties. But they ex ex absolutely executed the battle drill like they were supposed to. Tanks did what they were supposed to do. The infantry did what they were supposed to do. They didn't do it together. It's a problem that was going to come up later on. Um, there was a training uh, gap, essentially. But it, it went really well. Um, Farley Moat was heavily involved in this battle. It was one of his platoons that was into the action first. So after that, the 48th Highlanders then took over, and they were slowed down by mines and actually didn't make it to the, their objective that day, which is calata Giron. Garoni, excuse me, until almost midnight. Uh, and that was the town where the headquarters of the Hermann Goring Division had been until it was heavily, heavily bombed. And they figured that's where the Germans were and they pounded them. So on the morning of the 16th, the 48th and the Three Rivers Regiment actually entered the town uh, completely unopposed and took the town. At the same time, the 2nd Canadian Brigade also moved up the highway, 124, following 1st Brigade and took no casualties and passed it to take the lead with the 1st and 3rd Brigades then moving up towards Valuginera and Leon Fote. The 16th saw the 2nd Brigade move in with the Loyal Edmontons, uh, leading through uh, a place called San Michel de Gazarina, and then onto what is now Highway 117. And by noon, they were just south of a place called Piazza Armenia, which they attacked that afternoon with a serious fight, and it held up the Canadian advance for a better part of a day. Pardon me. On the 17th and 18th of July, 1943, saw the 3rd Canadian Brigade move into the lead with the Van Dues and what is now the New Brunswick Regiment at the time the Carleton and New York Regiment moving on the Enna Highway, while 1st Brigade moved northeast towards Valgonera, and they faced a hard fight with the Hastings Prince Edwards Regiment leading cross-country trying to go around Valgonera, and they attacked and were completely unsuccessful as were the RCR, and that's that little inlet in the bottom. They were trying to climb up and make this offensive. It was really rough. Um, on the 18th of town, the RCR actually attacked again and finally took the town. But their, set, their deputy commanding officer, a man named Major Pope, and I'm going to show you him in the photo in a second, um, he got killed in action. He decided to be, he was not supposed to be in the battle. He was left out of battle because he was the DCO and the CO was attacking or leading the attack. Uh, and he decided to go tank hunting with a brand new Piat that he really didn't know how to use. And he forgot to arm the bombs when he was launching at them. So he was trying to take on German tanks with a Piat that he forgot to arm. And he got cut down. So this attack, these, these days from the four, uh, 14th to the 18th, it cost 145 casualties with 40 killed in action. So that is uh, Major Pope. Uh, so this memorial here on the right-hand side, um, that's not far from where Major Pope was actually killed. Um, and, and that's Major Pope and Major Crow in, the, in that little picture. I'm going to show you another photo of them in a minute. And the other one is the PPCLI moving up. That's a Three Rivers Regiment tank in the background on the 19th of July, actually just moving up towards it. I didn't have any real good shots of the battle itself. But you can see from the train, the infantry were trying to go up these hills and down the other. And it's this rock scruff, dirty, unpaved, 
brutally hot time of year. So here we go. So Major Crow, oh, sorry, Major Pope is actually on the left hand side. Uh, and Major uh, Lieutenant Colonel Crow is on the right hand side. And this is just days. This is actually near that memorial where that photo, this photo is taken is right near the memorial. And, and they were both dead within um, like a week of each other. Um, as I said, Major Pope decided to go off and go tank hunting when he should not have. Uh, the one on the right hand side is just after as the PPC is next advance. That's them going into action uh, as much as an action photo can be. Again, open fields, but you can see in the background, big, huge mountains, right? So this is not easy country to fight through. So Agira. The fighting for Agira would involve all three of the brigades of the division, with the original attack actually planned for the 23rd, but had to be delayed because all getting everything in position took a lot longer than expected. Again, you'll see the arrows, you'll see troops moving forwards and around, and a couple of times people are kind of pushed back or repulsed. So that's when you see these Nicholson Stacy maps. These are some of the best maps of any official history. Uh, you can kind of see where they're where guys are going forward and backwards. So at 3 p.m. on the 24th, five field and two medium artillery regiments began to fire as the Royal Canadian Regiment with a squadron of the Three Rivers Regiment moved along the highway in the direction of a town called Nasoria. They covered about three miles without any problems, and they actually took the village of Nasoria by about 4.15. But that's when trouble really began, when a hidden force of Germans from the 2nd Battalion of the 104th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, opened fire as the RCR advanced past the outskirts of the town, which turned into an completely an insane fight. Uh, it also led to the death of Lieutenant Colonel Crow. He was moving up to see what was going on in the battle, and he was trying to find his forward troops. And he was calling out RCR, RCR, and a machine gun opened up on him, killed his radio uh, operator. Um, he then tried to fire back and then he was quickly cut down. And that essentially stopped the advance for the night. It just completely shut down the battalion. They'd lost, lost their CO in that battle and the DCO though, before that. Um, it was a real challenge for them. Uh, Storm Galloway was a famous RCR officer who wrote one of the histories of the battles, um, basically said that Colonel Crow was being dumb and um it kind of was. This is the this is the the first Canadian division that actually lost a lot of COs in Sicily. Again, first time in combat. So there's a lot of lieutenant colonels that die in this one. So late on the 24th, though, when it was realized that 20, the RCR weren't going to get through, the Hastings Prince Edward, now a man under the command of a man named Lord Tweedsmere, who is the son of um the former Governor General of Canada, um decided it took over and pressed on to the advance. Um, but two, ended up in a really tough fight with the Germans. And on the 25th, Lord Tweedsmere himself was also wounded. Um, so there's, there's two COs taken out really quickly. The previous CO to Tweedsmere uh, had been killed in action. Sutcliffe had died uh, just before Crow, um, actually with uh, Crow and Strom Galloway, um, with Strom Galloway saying it might have been his fault because his RCR cap badge was too shiny. That's a quote from Strom Galloway. Uh, the last unit uh, to go into this fight to try to clear this town was the 48th Highlanders. And at that time, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, their CO, began his attack at 6 p.m. And by midnight, had won the battle. Sorry, had, 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 by midnight, the battle was over. Sorry, and the Canadians were withdrawn. They didn't win this one yet. The 2nd Canadian Brigade moved up the next day on the 26th of July with the PPCLI and the Seaforths tasked to attack. And at 8 p.m., a barrage began, the heaviest gun to date by the Canadians with 80 guns firing, plus the tanks of Sea Squadron of the Three Rivers Regiment, plus the 90th Canadian anti-tank battery. Um, so D Company of the PPCLI actually took the first ridge um, and it basically crushed a force of Germans. They paused and they started to resume their attack, but then they hit some more resistance and they couldn't actually take the next ridge line. The PPCLI and the Super Brigade started doing things in like bite-sized chunks to try to get there. Uh, the Sea Force were put in and they couldn't take the ridge. The Sea Force put in their attack and with uh, more support, they were actually took the ridge by about 425 in the morning and they actually held the entire position by about 11 a.m. Bit of a pause on the 27th of July, the Sea Force went into action again um, at uh, attacking again another ridge, which they were able to capture with a lot of heavy uh, artillery and tank support. This is the Germans at this point in the battle. Uh, had started their planned withdrawal. Field Marshal Kesslering 
who was the supreme commander for the Axis powers in Italy, had started a phased delayed withdrawal. And we're talking some really great big ravines. You can see the changes in elevation on the map. This is a real tough time for them. They pressed on and, uh, and Seaforth pressed on. And then the loyal Edmonton Regiment got sent in uh, at about 8 uh, p.m. to help. And they kept on going and they finally took the final ridge position um, and, and, and finally got it. So when, while two brigade was staging this attack with its massive fire plan, when a Ford observer from the PCLI um, in a really good vantage point, he was actually trying to find this like perfect spot to call fire down for the PPCLI. He ended up driving into Aguirre. They, we never get his name in any of the histories, but this guy drove into the town of Aguirre. He's a gunner and realized there was no Germans like anywhere. So he quickly reported back. And at 2.30 that afternoon, the PPCLI entered without a shot fired. A very anticlimactic uh, end to a five-day battle that cost Canada 438 casualties. Literally, the fight for Aguilera was brutal. Lots of lots of tough fights. And um, yeah, it ended with literally just the, this observer stumbling into town. It's interesting. So this is... Um, the, the, on the right, that's the Three Rivers Regiment Sherman entering to Aguirre itself. And on the other side, those are Canadian soldiers guarding a whole bunch of German and Italian prisoners of war in the village of Aguirre itself. Really one of the toughest fights that I had ever read. It's really intense fighting. It was kind of, it's really hard to see it. So the other thing about Aguirre, which is awesome, is this is where the, the uh, Aguirre Canadian War Cemetery is. Uh, and so there's like 490 uh, internments in the cemetery. And this is the view from the cemetery overlooking. It's absolutely beautiful. So like most Italian cemeteries, they are pretty spectacular and gorgeous. It's just something about them. So the final phase. So this, this kind of happens concurrently to the Aguirre fight in a sense, because this is when kind of third brigade's also taking place. So while taking Val Valganera, the second brigade, of course, continued its advance north to a place called uh, Leon Forte. Um, with the Seaforths and PPCLI. And they actually met some rear guards and demolitions that by the Germans that slowed them down a great deal. And on the 19th of August, uh, or 19th of July, sorry, the Canadians actually had their first glimpse of Mount Etna, which is a pretty spectacular thing. Um, having been there and seeing it, it's very imposing. Uh, the Loyal Edmontons advanced and secured actually a river crossing over a river called the Ditanio. Uh, and the PPCLI then and took uh, a place called Mount de Sierra Rossi. Five miles downstream from them at a place called de Tiano Station, the 48th Highlanders and then the RCR with C Squadron of the Three Rivers Regiment uh, took the high ground overlooking this town and crossing. And that night, the Hastings Prince Edward um, attack were, were tasked to attack a place called Asoro. But during the recce, its lieutenant colonel was killed when a shell struck him as he was doing a forward recce. So they went in to, under the command of the deputy commanding officer and their attempt to capture the town without, they went in with a plan to capture the town without losing anyone. But when they did that, it took a two day tough fight with the entire taking, brigade taking part to take the whole town and actually the holding of the town. The second brigade took the town of Leon Forte with the Edmontons and the Seaforts, um, or after, sorry, after the Seaforts had been hit by um, Allied artillery falling short on them. They were forming up to their attack. They were about to go in. Rounds fell short, hit part of the time headquarters, hit part of the leading attack companies. Um, brigade commanders swapped them out very quickly with the LER because they were completely disrupted. It, it was a long fight and, and it wasn't easy. And it took actually bringing the PPCLI to come in to support to finish the attack. And after three days, taking the two major towns here cost another 275 Canadian casualties. Um, and all of these operations were done as part of the lead up to the advance up to Nasoria and Aguirre. While the 3rd Brigade didn't actually directly participate in the Aguirre fighting, but they actually moved down the Titano Valley uh, towards the village of Catanova, fighting a series of actions over hilltops and bridges and towns until turning north and capturing Catanova itself with the, the West Nova Scotia Regiment. Uh, and then they moved into the town of Rosinaria and Mount Cicerina. Uh, and then rejoining the rest of the division to take the final uh, brigade object or divisional objective, Adriano, on the 7th of August, 1943, by the Van Deuce. After Gira, the second brigade, of course, moved on and took a place called Hill 736 uh, and Mount Rivisoto 
by the LER and Mount Sagio by the PPCLI on the 6th of August. So when you go to the to Sicily, when you go to these towns, you can actually just literally walk into the town and that's exactly where they were fighting because the roads were really critical. And all these little hilltop towns are all still in existence. They're all these little barely touched and changed places. One brigade captured the town of Rigalbuto on the 3rd of August, using all three of its units to move in and around the town with the 48th actually holding the town, the Hasty Peas capturing a mount just southeast of it, essentially cutting off the town. The 10th of August, 1943 saw the end of the Canadian part of the operation in Sicily. Uh, from the first, the 11th to the 13th of August, they moved actually to the Southern end of the Catania Plain, uh, back to one of their old battlefields just north of, um, uh, just near um, uh, Catania. They had earned their rest. They had actually walked because remember I said they lost three ships? That was most of their transport that went down. So they lost a lot of their brigade transport. They lost a lot of their divisional transport and they lost some divisional headquarters vehicles. So the infantry was forced to walk 120 miles in 38 days in hot mountainous terrain. It was brutal. It cost 2,300 tons. Uh, 2,300 casualties in total during the campaign, of which 562 were actually killed. 490 of these are actually are interned at Aguirre War Cemetery. Cemetery with the missing from this campaign are listed on the Casino Memorial to the missing of the Italian campaign. So the missing soldiers from this campaign that are have no known grave, their names are commemorated actually on the mainland itself. So it was a very tough 38 day battle. So. That is uh, Sergeant H.E. Cooper uh, on the 11th of August, 1943, coming out of the line. Uh, you'll see he's wearing, his sleeves are rolled up. He looks really mangy and dirty, and he's got a mosquito net around his head and a beard. Because, of course, water was always a challenge. Uh, he survived the war. In fact, he was not a casualty. Uh, on the other side, those are members of the LER uh, moving into Valgunera. Uh, the umbrella is a very uh, important thing. And that's a universal carrier. So it's a platoon-level vehicle they were using, like a truck jeep. So some other parts of it. So this is a fairly famous photo on the right. It's Canadian mechs treating some wounded near Valgunera when they were taking the town. Um, the unit has never been officially identified. I've seen it listed as the LER and I've seen it listed as the PPCLI, but I can't see enough of the badges to tell you who they are. And the other, that's a Sherman tank again, uh, entering Regubella, Reg Regal Buto on the 3rd of August. Now, here's a mention because I know there's Air Force people in the room. The Royal Canadian Navy and the RCF had a huge role to play in the invasion of Sicily and is never talked about because uh, the history of the services aren't there and we just don't think about these things. So for the RCAF, number 417 squadron flew Spitfire 5C variants, so they're 20 millimeter cannon arms Spitfires. Um, they flew in the battle as part of 244 wing. Um, so they were a fighter wing that was part of the Desert Air Force and flew missions all over Sicily. And this is one of their Spitfires actually on Sicily at the end of August, getting ready to do fighter missions to fly in support of the operations because the Canadians at this point were just about to start operations to invade Italy mainland itself. Pardon me. So that's kind of cool. Um, but there was also a, a bomber wing there, an entirely Canadian bomber wing, 331 wing, uh, flew Wellington 3 or 10 bombers, um, different versions of it. And it was made up of 410, 424, and 425 squadrons all three Canadian, flying as, flying as part of this. Uh, and those bombers flew every day of the campaign in Sicily, but six. They flew missions every single day, but six in the whole battle, which is an impressive feat for a, a light bomber or a medium bomber. So there was also some RAF squadron pilots. They, so there were RCAF pilots, but they flew in RCA, RAF squadrons. So there'll be there's RAF air crew at Aguirre and uh, one of the other cemeteries on the island that are Canadians interned and commemorated there, but they they served with RAF squadrons. But this is these are the, the all RAF guy, RCF guys and RCF squadrons that I'm talking about a moment ago. The other one is the Royal Canadian Navy had four flotillas of landing craft participate in, in the actual Sicilian campaign. There were no warships. They'd all been withdrawn from the Mediterranean after Operation Torch to protect the sea lanes, uh, do our convoys. We needed them there more than anything else. But the 55th and 61st landing craft assault flotillas, so like the little assault boats that were platoon sized, uh, landed troops directly on the beaches on the 9th and 10th, 1940 of August, uh, July 1943. And the 80th and 81st landing craft mechanized. Uh, which are bigger, their vehicle type ones, landed tanks and armored fighting vehicles and trucks 
Um, and they spent the entire campaign because it was there was no ports captured in Sicily. They were literally supplied over the beaches. These guys were the the flotillas, and those are Royal Canadian Navy flotillas, completely manned by the Royal Canadian Navy. So together, the the flotillas, the four flotillas, landed nine thousand vehicles, forty thousand men, and forty thousand tons of supply in the Sicilian campaign. But I also have to mention this. Sicily is not just a battlefield. Don't get me wrong. It's a lot of battlefield. And there's British, there's American, there's Canadian. But it's also a really fabulous beach destination. So you can turn this into a real family holiday. It is gorgeous. That's what we did. Um, absolutely fabulous place to visit. There's beaches, as I said, great food, hiking, wine touring, ancient ruins everywhere. It's fabulous. Uh, that's Mount Etna. Absolutely spectacular to, to see and visit. Highly recommend it. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, the Sicilian campaign is really important to Canada because it was our really first step. And so the 1st Canadian Division and the 1st Canadian Armoured Brigade were the Canadian Army units that were in combat the longest in the first world in the Second World War. So they went into action on the 10th of July, 1943, and they fought right until the end, the 8th of May, 1945. So they were the like leading edge of the Canadian Army in the Second World War. So thank you very much, everyone.